Welcome to Life Imitating Movies, a weekly podcast where myself, Mitch, my co-host Brad, we talk about news stories from the past week and the movies that we think have been already made that reflect those events. But that's not what we're doing this week. We're doing a, something a little bit different where this episode, we're taping it before the Oscars in 2021, but this will air the day after the Oscars. So instead, what we're going to do is this episode, we took a look back at all the past winners in all the different categories and picked our favorites for, you know, best picture, best actor, best director, all those kind of ones. And we're going to talk about some of our favorite past winners, kind of a wind down episode from the Oscars this year. So, you know, let's just get right into it. We got our list of categories. We got our list of our past favorites, winners from the categories. You know, we're not going to talk about candidates that maybe didn't win, but should have. But we're just going to talk about the ones that won. So starting off, we got our best picture. You know, we're going to start with the most exciting category and kind of work our way down. So best picture, you know, there are so many good ones to pick from. Uh, where, where did you start with this one? Just kind of give like a little explanation before we kind of dive into you know this episode and revealing our favorites uh yeah so you know i went through and i went through the wikipedia page for all the uh the award yeah yeah yeah. and you know you start at the beginning you know you went all the way back to the beginning you know i, I was i was like you know i didn't i there were there were ones I, I almost picked wings you know the first ever best picture winner but I was like, you know what? That would be a short conversation. So I, most of my picks today are, are contemporary. I think the oldest pick I have is from 89. So you want me to go ahead and launch in with my best picture pick? Absolutely. Let's hear it. All right. I, I went with Rocky from 19. Oh, okay. So 1975. So I already lied to you. My oldest pick is 1975. I'm a moron. But no, I went with Rocky because it's interesting that like at one best picture, one best director, won all these Oscars. But the man who created the story and fought for the lead role didn't win anything. He, uh, Sylvester Stallone never became an Oscar winner, just an Oscar nominee. And I always found that interesting because as a writer, the story of how he got Rocky made is like one of the most inspirational stories, I think, in, in movie history. Yeah, it kind of goes along with this movie that it has this whole underdog atmosphere to it, whether it's winning all these awards or whether it was getting made in the first place. That whole underdog attitude seems to follow the original Rocky. And I kind of look at it like that where I wouldn't have, I wasn't alive in 1975, but I wouldn't picture this as a awards favorite, awards heavy movie. You know, it's certainly a movie that a lot of people enjoy and has its time and place and was a, a big hit when it came out. But I certainly wouldn't have looked at this movie as a movie that was going to clean up at awards season. So, again, it just feels like it kind of carries that underdog mentality with it, what the movie embodies winning this best picture from 1975. Oh, yeah. And when you look at what it's up against, it was nominated against All the President's Men, which is a classic film, Bound for Glory, I'm not sure what that is, Network, and Taxi Driver. So that was a stacked year. And for Rocky to come away with that that win, was it was pretty monumental for, for exactly what you said, that the type of film it is. So for my pick for this category, for Best Picture, my favorite kind of past winner of this category that I picked out, I'm going to fast forward exactly 40 years into the future. And the movie that I wanted to mention, and I've talked about it a little bit before on the podcast, is the 2015 Best Picture winner, Spotlight. And this movie, I really like it. It's it's one of my favorite categories kind of in this genre that I've talked about on the show before, which is historical drama, which is kind of a drama movie that's based off of real life events. That's uh, They always seem to be very well acted very well directed and maybe even educate you a little bit on past events that you may not have been aware of or how exactly they transpired if you were aware of them before. So Spotlight to me is such a great movie. For those who may not know, it kind of deals with the whole sweeping kind of revelation about Catholic, the Catholic Church and the abuse that they were covering up by their priests for children and molestation. So it's obviously very heavy subject material. But I think it's handled very well in this movie. And again, a lot of great performances. It's got a great cast. And it just tells the story so well. And it's just 
it's not something that you really kind of binge over and over again like an action movie but it is a, a great movie to go back and watch occasionally absolutely yeah, 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 and if you're watching the video, you'll notice I'm an idiot. You said 40 years in the future, and if you watch my mouth, I said Braveheart because I it's it's still early for me, I guess, because I was thinking 20 years, not 40. But yeah, Spotlight is uh, I actually I it is a movie I can watch over and over again because I journalism movies are like some of my favorite movies. Spotlight, The Post, The Paper, another Michael Keaton movie. Um, um, all the president's men and stuff. And I, I really love investigative journalism movies like that because they, they're, they're, they're thrillers, right? They don't think of them as thrillers, but that's what they are because they're trying to get to the truth of something. And um, yeah, Spotlight is phenomenal, dude. And Rachel McAdams got her Oscar nomination for that. Um, Michael Keaton didn't get a nomin or no, did he? I, I can't remember if he did. I think he did actually, but it was, it was, yeah, it's a great movie. Well, either way, even if uh, Keaton wasn't nominated for a spotlight, because I can't remember off the top of my head either, but I know you are a big Michael Keaton fan. You like almost everything that he's been in. And if I remember correctly, he did later get an, an Oscar nomination if he hadn't before with Birdman. So, you know, the thing is, he's he's such a great actor. And, you know, like you said, with Rachel McAdams getting nominated for her role in this movie, He's far from the only great actor in this movie, Mark Ruffalo as well. And people maybe know him in households as the Hulk, but he's still quite a, a good actor as well. And he has a great part in this. So it's just all around. It's a great movie that I love watching that I think deserved its best picture win in 2015. Oh, yeah. yeah. Birdman came the year before that. He should have won that year. That was the year Eddie Redmayne won. But at Michael Keaton does have the distinction of the SAG Awards. He's the only actor to be in three best ensemble wins with just this past year or just this few weeks ago winning for uh, trial of Chicago seven. So he does have that distinction under his belt. So next up we have our best director category. And this is again, one that I kind of struggle with because it's obviously one of the bigger categories and there's a lot to pick from in terms of talented directors and great movies that they obviously directed. So with this one, this might be a little bit of a theme with the episode. When I was doing research for this episode, I came across winners that I just, it was a razor thin margin for who I wanted to talk about and who kind of got runner up. So I will mention my honorable mention kind of pick first about it just, it just kind of missed. And that is the film Saving Private Ryan from 1998 directed by Steven Spielberg. And I really don't think you can talk about a best director category or winner in the modern era without mentioning this name. I think Steven Spielberg, one of the best living directors these days. So it was close, but that wasn't the movie that I picked. But that is my kind of honorable mention for this category. So the winner I did go with, another one of my favorite living directors, is the 2006 best pick, best director winner, excuse me, for The Departed, directed by Martin Scorsese. And, you know, this is a movie I could watch over and over again. So many twists and turns, so many great performances, such great direction, obviously, when you're talking about this category, best director. Just a, a masterfully put together movie by Martin Scorsese, and far from his only one, but this is the one that I really like the most from him that I could go and watch over and over again, and just great direction when you're talking about this category. Yeah, and that was the one that finally brought, that was his first and only Oscar to date, Scorsese's only Oscar, which is like, how the hell does Scorsese only have one? It's insane. Um, but yeah, I, I look back at Scorsese's filmography, and I think Departed is my favorite of his, barely beating Goodfellas, but I think Departed, just as a whole, I, it's funny. Like it has, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty funny movie, if you actually sit back and watch it, the the kills in the movie are shocking, you know. There, there, there are some pretty shocking kills in that movie, and and DiCaprio and, and Damon and you know Anthony Anderson is in it. You know, it's got a, a Jack Nicholson is phenomenal in it. You know, uh, the the ending shot is like that whole you know the rat on the ledge, which was a lot of people were like, oh, that was that was tacky, and I'm like, no, that's genius, man. Yeah. And when talking about this category, best director, you know, winning for this, The Departed, obviously you mentioned all the actors that are in it and they certainly give great performances. But 
I think it's a testimony to Martin Scorsese's ability as a director to get the most out of these actors and get the most out of their performances to kind of push them in good directions and just get the most out of them for the movie. So I think it really speaks to his talent as a director to really, you know, get the most out of those guys for the movie. Yeah. And the Frank Costello, which is Nicholson's character, he's based off of um, the black mass guy, the guy who Johnny Depp played in black mass, the notorious uh, guy, uh, Boston, Boston gangster and stuff. Yep. Whitey Bulger. Whitey Bulger. Thank you. Whitey Bulger. Thank you. Yeah. And so it's interesting when you know that little tidbit to wa- go back and watch the movie and stuff. It's, 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 it's a great, it's, it's one of the best movies ever made without a shadow of a doubt. So where did you kind of go with this best director category? Who did you kind of pick to represent from a past winner? I went with a movie that like the scope of the movie was so large and it was, it's one of the highest grossing movies ever made. Um, for a long time, it was the highest grossing movie ever made. Yep. There you go. It's uh, James Cameron for Titanic. I mean, he was the king of the world, which I never understood. He got so much crap when he gave his Oscar speech. He said, I'm the king of the world. And everybody was like, yeah, he's got so much ego. It's like, no, morons. That was a quote from the movie, DiCaprio, I'm king of the world. Like, I never understood why he got crap for that. But I, I just, I love Titanic. It's, it's, it's another, it's another top movie for me, man. It is, it's, it, the, and it's the scope of it. It's not an intimate movie, man. And it just what he did with that movie and, and I, I, I was reading, I actually collect my entertainment weeklies from all the movie preview issues, all get dating back to like 95. Yeah, I'm a nerd. But Titanic was originally supposed to be released in the summer of that year, but it was going over budget. So there were so many articles about how Titanic is going to be a Titanic of a movie. It's going to be a failure and everything. And then it came out and Obviously, it stuck around the, the top of the charge for, I think, 13 or, or 20 some weeks or something like that. It obviously became a, one of the biggest grossing movies of all time. So uh, just the scope of Titanic makes James Cameron my pick. Yeah, deservedly so. He is a masterful filmmaker. And if you kind of look at stories, articles, documentaries about how he made Titanic, his attention to detail is astounding. He wanted to get everything right went back and looked at log books and diary entries and the wreck of the Titanic and kind of extrapolated what it would look like back then. And it just, he really got it right. He, whether or not you like Titanic or James Cameron or his movies, what have you, he certainly has an attention to detail and there's no denying that and what he got right in this movie. And it still is a very well-made movie that I think holds up to this day. And it has a little bit something for everybody. It has obviously the historical aspect to it. It has, you know, obviously the romance, which is central to the plot. It has some recognizable faces and kind of has a few other plot lines in the movie. So it's it's just, it's just great. It's it's a very well directed movie when we're talking about this category for best director winner. Exactly. Yeah, and and he did a documentary as well where he, you know, they go down to the wreckage of the Titanic, and it's a great documentary. Uh, seeing the actual wreckage and stuff and and yeah great flick next up is our category for past best actor winner so the best actor winners of the past and for mine i'm just going to launch right into it so this one i'm sure you'll agree with me and maybe maybe one of these will have the same pick although there are so many winners of the past that are great but maybe we might have the same pick for this so for my favorite best actor winner that I kind of researched and went back and looked at, I landed on Anthony Hopkins for his 1991 role in Silence of the Lambs. And w- what can you say about this performance? He won the best actor category for, the, he won the Academy Award for best actor in 1991, but arguably he should be a supporting actor in this movie under that category because his character only has. I think it's less than 20 minutes of screen time in the movie, if I'm remembering that correctly. He's not really the main antagonist, and he's not really the lead actor in the movie. So I think it's just a testament to his performance and how big of an impact he had in Silence of the Lambs that really landed him in this category and got him the win. And Silence of the Lambs obviously won kind of the big five in its heyday, which are best picture, best director, best actor, best actress, 
and I think that's four. I might be forgetting one. But Anthony Hopkins certainly deserved this award and was just, he plays a deranged serial killer, but you still find him incredibly charming and captivating. And it's just, it's just such a masterful performance. Yeah. Uh, and my top five performances of all time, uh, Hannibal Lecter is number two, just behind Heath Ledger's Joker. Um, it is, without a doubt, one of the greatest performances ever. And it's a testament to Anthony Hopkins that this past year with The Father, he gave another one of my top performances of all time. That guy is just, he, he's one of the best actors to ever live. Um, <clears throat> and I like, you know, the fact that like the most iconic scene or whatever from uh, that movie is his, you know, I ate his liver with some fiber beans with ice chilled candy and he goes and the if that's coming through at all on the thing and if, if it is, I'm sorry, that probably sounded disgusting. But um that that was an improv by him. And that wasn't actually in the script or anything. He just did it in the moment and it became the most iconic part of that movie. Maybe with the exception of the goodbye horses dance. <laughs> Yeah, so fantastic movie, fantastic performance by Anthony Hopkins. So I, I'm guessing that you didn't have this one, so you picked a different actor, or best actor winner from the past. I'll be honest. I almost did pick that because I know it's one of your favorites, but I was like, I didn't because I went with one, a recent winner that actually became one of my all-time favorite performances, <clears throat> which is Casey Affleck in Manchester by the Sea. Because that movie is I think that is the best performance of grief <clears throat> I have ever seen. It is his performance is it, it, it's funny. You got Lucas Hedges in it and he's a funny kid and everything. And he's dealing with the death of his brother and everything. And it's, it is for my money, it is a perfect performance in how to portray grief and, and inner, you know, how do you put on the screen such inner whatever turmoil i guess is the term how do you put that on screen <clears throat> sorry and i think casey affleck nailed it in that movie yeah manchester by the sea is one of these that i've kind of had on my list for a while that i said well it certainly looks like i would like it and i'm gonna get around to it eventually but just haven't quite watched it yet so this is one that when it came out initially that again it looked good i thought okay i'm gonna want to see this at some point and I just quite haven't gotten there yet, but I'm sure once I do, I'm sure I'll agree with you about the performances. And Casey Affleck, say what you will about him personally, but he certainly obviously gave a great performance in this movie. So one one of these days, I'll get to Manchester by the Sea and check out his performance for sure. Yeah, dude. <clears throat> and it's, it's, it's a testament, too. He was up against Ryan Gosling for La La Land that year, and I... You know, you know my love for La La Land, and, and so for me to be like, rightfully so, Casey Affleck took that Oscar. That, that tells you how much I love that performance. So, getting into the flip side of this category, we have our best actress, our past winners from the Academy Awards from past years, and for my money, this maybe isn't certainly the most drama heavy or incredibly well acted, but it's certainly a very commit to the role and very entertaining role of a past winner, and that is Sandra Bullock from the 2009 movie, The Blind Side. And when I say that, I mean because she isn't quite doing, when you see a Best Actress winner, you see they went all out, they gave a really teary, emotional drama performance, and Sandra Bullock just, she became the character in this movie for what is pretty much an entertaining, almost kind of family-friendly movie about a player kind of making it through tough circumstances into the NFL and being taken in by this wealthy family based on a true story, of course. But Sandra Bullock just went, she became the character and just became a entertaining, fun to watch. All eyes were on her whenever she was on screen character in this movie. And it was just kind of a, a fun win in my eyes. It was just kind of a, you gave a great performance and we're really entertained by it. So she won the Academy Award this year. And I think she deserved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, uh, I remember her waiting for that. I love Sandra Bullock. I've loved her since Demolition Man. So uh, her winning was awesome. Um, it's a movie I've only ever seen one time. I like football movies and stuff, but, you know, it's a, it's not 
when I go to watch a football movie, I'm, I'm generally throwing in something like, you know, any given Sunday or, or invincible. I love as well, but um, just to see Sandra Bullock win an Oscar was, was awesome. Um, now there was a couple of years later, she was nominated for gravity. She didn't when she lost that to Kate Blanchett for uh, uh, the Woody Allen movie. I think she should have won that year. She should be a two time winner, but you know, Sandra Bullock Oscar winner. I'm not going to, not going to have any qualms with, I love Sandra Bullock. Yeah, it's great to be able to say that because she's one of these actresses that a lot of people really seem to like to watch in her movies. And Gravity, that's up for debate if she should have won for that, possibly. But Kate Blanchett, obviously a very talented actress as well. So where did you go with your best actress pick? So this is actually the only one of the picks I actually went back and watched this week because I hadn't seen it in such a long time, which was Jennifer Lawrence for Silver Linings Playbook. Oh, okay, that face tells me you're not a fan of the movie, or I, I, I think the movie's genius. I think I think the movie was good. I, I will just say I think her winning over the other people that were nominated in this year was a little controversial. That yeah, she was good in the movie, but I think maybe at the time, if I, if I remember correctly, that people were arguing that there were other people in the category that were nominated that deserved it more. So. I certainly think she's talented. I think she did a good job in the movie, but I, I'm kind of with some of these other people where should she have won? I'm not sure about that, but irregardless, I still enjoy her performance in the movie in Silver Linings Playbook. I enjoy the movie and I do enjoy Jennifer Lawrence as an actress. Hey, I absolutely love Jennifer Lawrence as an actress. She's phenomenal. And as uh, every interview you see her in, she's, she's just seems super personable. I, I like it, Jennifer Lawrence. So the other nominees that year were Jessica Chastain for Zero Dark Thirty, Emmanuel Riva for Amor, which is a, a foreign film about elderly people, uh, Quivanjane Wallace from Beasts of the Southern Wild. She was a young actress who was nominated that year, um, who went on to play Annie, I believe, in the remake of Annie, and Naomi Watts for The Impossible, which was that tsunami movie. So I, the only one there... The only one there that I've seen besides that one, honestly, was Zero Dark Thirty. And honestly, if Jessica Chastain would have won that year, I'd be fine with that as well. I love that movie. But I, I, I'm going to have to say I think Jennifer Lawrence rightfully won that year. Fair enough. You know, that's why we have this show. We have these discussions because we like to just debate and express our opinions and, you know, maybe try to change each other's minds, but just discuss these kind of things. So, you know, it's up for debate. And what do you, whatever you think at home, you know, have your own inner discussion or discussion with other people. So, you know, I'm a, I'm of one mind, you're of the other, and, you know, we'll we'll see what, what we argue about next on this episode. Good. All right. So I will say in terms of this movie, um, I think it's a phenomenal dive into mental illness. I mean, Bradley Cooper was phenomenal in the movie, just portraying a guy who kind of went crazy when he caught his wife cheating on him. Jennifer Lawrence is a, is a, is a girl who kind of went, not crazy, but went, you know, sunk into the depths of depression when her husband passed away. And I, I, I genuinely appreciate that. And you have great supporting characters. I mean, Robert De Niro got a, his first Oscar nomination for that movie after I think it was like 20 or 30 years for that. You know, Chris Tucker is phenomenal in it. Shea Wigman is in it. It's great, great, great movie overall. So for this next one, we're looking at past best supporting actor winners and I have a feeling for this one we picked the same one because I went with Heath Ledger from the 2008 movie The Dark Knight. And I remember you had just mentioned previously that for your money, that's one of your all-time favorite performances. So I will just say really quick, did you pick the same one? No, and I feel kind of stupid that I didn't, man. I should have. Yeah, that's that's a that's a complete mis misstep on my part. Yeah, so for my money, Heath Ledger as the Joker in The Dark Knight Obviously, we've had some different performances of this character over the years, and most recently with Joaquin Phoenix doing an astounding job in the 2019 movie Joker. But for my money, no one's ever going to beat this. No one's ever going to do a better job as this character than Heath Ledger did. And we're for sure going to get more iterations of this character because people love Batman. They're just going to keep making Batman movies until the end of time, and the Joker is going to be there along with him. So I don't think anyone will ever still eclipse Heath Ledger as the Joker. It just, this was, and probably still is, if you twist my arm, my favorite movie. It became my favorite movie when I saw it 
when it first came out. And obviously, like a lot of other people, I was just captivated by his performance. And it was just so tragic that um, you could argue that this was what kind of cost him his life, that he sunk himself too deep into the character and became a little unstable mentally. And it's such a shame that we don't get to see more of Heath Ledger, that he didn't have a longer career after this. But for my money, one of the best performances ever and the, probably the best iteration of the character that we'll see. Uh, yeah, I agree. Obviously, that is my all-time favorite performance. I've studied that performance. If you look over my shoulder here, it's a Heath Ledger Joker mask right next to my Joaquin Phoenix Joker action figure that cost me a, a lot more money than I expected it to cost me. But um, it's, uh, yeah, it's when you read into the performance, when you watch the performance, there's little ticks that he does in that movie that aren't directed. They're all Heath Ledger. The way he sucks his cheeks when he's perform when he talks in the between talking, just su he sucks his cheeks. He licks his lips. Those little ticks, man, that like make that performance evil. And and one of the best performances, not one of the best performance in my book ever, because it's just those little. As an actor studying that role, you really can be like. Ooh, okay. That's what he brought to this man. Like he he brought so much to that performance just from those little things, like sucking his cheeks, licking his lips, just the, his voice, the way he worked on his voice. So a lot of people may not know that those things, like you just talked about, the ticks, those were not intentional. They were improvised or kind of done subconsciously by Heath Ledger because the little licks that like his tongue kind of darts out sometimes when he's talking is because the makeup, he was kind of doing that uh, as a, a nervous tick or kind of an unconscious thing that he was doing because of the makeup on his face. And they liked it so much that they kept it in the movie as a trait of his character. And again, just as a testimony to his performance in the movie, the scene where he kind of corners Maggie Gyllenhaal and he's kind of in, their, in her face with the knife, kind of doing a little bit of a monologue about how he got those scars that her acting in that was only kind of half acting. She was legitimately a little, a little scared of him when he was in her face with the makeup that he had and the performance that he was giving. She was legitimately kind of scaring her a little bit. If you go back and watch that scene, some of that is not her pretending to be uncomfortable. Some of that is her really just being so engrossed by his performance that she felt genuinely uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and that's pretty funny too. When it's like they're in that, that tells you how acting is. Like they're in that moment, and she's scared of him. But really, you know, Heath Ledger is, you know, her and uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal's brother, and he and Heath Ledger are like the best of friends. You know, I think Heath Ledger was, or Jill, Jake Gyllenhaal was Heath Ledger's baby's godfather and everything. So you know, that whole family is super close. But that kind of tells you, man. Once you call action, you kind of just get into the role, and 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 he got into the role like none other yeah so i'm a little disappointed that you say it's one of your favorite performances but then you didn't pick it to kind of talk about with this best supporting actor the the past winners so what did you go with instead well i have a few a few listed here that i wanted i was going to talk about you know in keeping with i had jack nicholson from a few good men he didn't win that year he lost to gene hackman for unforgiven and I think that performance is one of the best. It's like my monologue I did for auditions, which is why I never got booked. Um, but I actually went with another guy that's over my shoulder, Robin Williams from Goodwill Hunting. Um, that, that poster back there is one of my all time favorite quotes that he gave, which is, uh, you're only given a, a single spark of insanity. You mustn't lose it. And that's a Robin Williams quote. And I just love that quote. But right, when Robin Williams finally won for Goodwill Hunting, man, it was, it's it's one of my favorite performances again i think you know seeing you see this comedic actor just delve into this dramatic role man and the scene where he takes matt damon by the throat and says you know you talk about my wife again i will effing end you that's like one of my favorite line deliveries of all time yeah robin williams certainly gave a great performance and deservedly won the award for best supporting actor for goodwill hunting but it's a shame because we're talking about these two, they're similar where these late great actors that unfortunately we kind of lost before their time. And 
this is one that you can go back and certainly a lot of people remember him for his comedic roles. But I think in hindsight now, after his death, if you go back and watch his performance in Good Will Hunting, it hits even harder because of him passing maybe a little bit before his time. And it adds more drama to his performance and more gravity to it. So I certainly think it's one that you can go back and, and keep watching. And he certainly captivated audiences when it came out and still kind of earns his screen time with this one. So certainly a deserving winner. Moving on to our next category, we have past winners from the best supporting actress category. So with this one, I picked somebody who gave a performance in a movie that I only just saw recently. I saw this movie a few months back, and that is Lupita Nyong'o's performance from 12 Years a Slave, uh, winning the 2013 Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. And I'd only seen this movie for the first time a few months ago, and it is a brutal yet needed honest depiction of slavery and obviously it's based on a true story as well but so Lupita Nyong'o obviously she's the supporting actress it's not her story but when she shows up in the movie and the performance that she gives it's just astounding and it's very much you feel terrible for the people in the movie and especially for her character which is just put through the ringer and she brings such a tragic elements or her character and just it is a it is an amazing performance to be sure oh yeah and that was her first movie that was her first movie out of uh out of acting school and then she won the oscar for it and rightfully so dude it was a it's a great movie it is a uh you know that was the movie that brought brad pitt his first ever oscar because he actually produced it and that movie won best picture um and she she is I know she was up against she was up against Jennifer Lawrence that year for American Hustle, and I think that was the big who's it gonna go to between the two of them. And I, as much as I love Jennifer Lawrence and I loved um, um, American Hustle, I think yeah, Lupita Nyong'o rightfully took that Oscar because she came out of the gate somebody you haven't heard of, and 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 you were like, okay, you didn't forget her name from there because she's gone on to just do phenomenal work, man. She's she's a great actress. Yeah, I, I really can't, off the top of my head, think of a bad Lupita Nyong'o performance in the movies that she's been in, because even if some of the movies maybe have been varying in terms of quality, I think her performance, she always gives a great one. And it, recently, she's kind of anchored the movie Us and, you know, a couple other ones where it's just like, again, you see her range because you talk about those two movies and what her characters do and how they act. It's very it, it it's it's a world apart from the the characters that she plays. So I think she's a very talented actress and very deserving of this award when she won in 2013 for for 12 Years a Slave. Excuse me. Yeah, dude, you hit the nail on the head. Us, she probably should have been nominated for us, dude. She was, to to play the dual roles the way she did in Us was so freaking great. Well, we've talked about it on the podcast before. The Academy hates horror movies. They've kind of snubbed a lot of people that deserve at least nominations, if not wins. Uh, a recent example that we've touched upon on a past episode was Toni Collette for Hereditary, and she wasn't nominated for that, and it was just a an amazing performance on her part. So I think the Academy just hates horror movies. Probably, because I think this year The Invisible Man should have been up for a lot of the stuff, and it isn't. But uh, I'll slip in with my pick, which is kind of like a Lupita Nyong'o pick in that this was an actress who I she had a hell of a year. So she came out of the gate with Ex Machina in March or April. OK, then she had The Man from Uncle, you know, a summer movie. Then she stars in The Danish Girl, wins the Oscar for The Danish Girl. And I'm talking about Alicia Vikander. So I just think, like, I love, like, that. Oh, she was also in Burnt with Bradley Cooper, which is, like, a decent little cooking movie. But, um, you know, it's just like this. Just think about that. Like, a lot of these actresses that come out, you like, you've seen them a lot before, and you're like, all right, they deserve their Oscar. They're finally going to win their Oscar. And then here's Lucia Vikander. I didn't hear – I've never – the previous Oscar season, I'd never even heard of the girl. And then she just has, like, a hell of a year. Personally – I think she should have been nominated and probably won for Ex Machina. Ex Machina, such a great movie. But she she was great in The Danish Girl as well. Danish Girl is a, a true story about a uh, 
a couple and, and the guy is played by Eddie Redmayne is a, a transsexual man and everything. And it's, it's a very good, good movie. Great performances, kind of a period piece and everything. But I just like that story. I like the arc of Alicia Vikander from that year. Yeah. Ex Machina has been on my watch list forever. And eventually I will see it because it's one of these high concept sci-fi movies, which I really enjoy kind of in the same vein as a recent one, like Annihilation where you're dealing with themes and messages and have to kind of interpret what they're, what they're trying to say in a sci-fi movie, but it deals with some big concepts and Ex Machina certainly does that. And like I said, eventually I will get to it because it's just, again, one of those masterfully, masterfully made and acted movies. But yeah, I think you're right. I think she certainly deserved this award when she won it this year. And, you know, I think you're right where you don't really, it's like Lupita Nyong'o and then this actress as well, where you don't really know of them until award season starts to come up. And then you're almost maybe a little bit mad when they kind of steal the Oscar away from a favorite of yours that hadn't really won one before. But then over time, you start to see more of their body of work or go back and watch some movies that they've been in. And you realize, oh, this person that I hadn't really heard that much about before is actually a very talented actress. And I'm going to start to pay attention to movies that they're going to be in and really want to see more of what they can do. Yeah, yeah. And then it was nice. Um, so did you know that when you said Annihilation, did you know that that's the same writer and director or was that just a coincidence? You know, I think it was a subconscious thing because I did know that Alex Garland, who was a writer director of Ex Machina and Annihilation, just again, two great high concept sci fi movies. So I, I do, I am a fan and I, I can't wait to see what, you know, is produced next in that same vein that they kind of get their hands on. But yeah, getting back to Best Supporting Actress, I think she absolutely deserved this win. And like Lupita Nyong'o, I'm always ex excited to see what she can do next. Oh, yeah. And what she did next was actually she was my co-star when I was a background performer in Jason Bourne, which she was in. So she's my co-star. That's how we phrase that. But yeah, that's all I got to say about that. So now kind of dipping out of the big categories at the Oscars, the first one we're getting into is Best Original Screenplay, talking about past winners. And the one that I picked, this was one that took the, the world by storm and certainly was not one that people were expecting to do as well as it did when it came out. And that is the movie Get Out, a winner, a past winner for Best Original Screenplay. And when this movie came out, like I said, it kind of took the world by storm. People weren't expecting it to do as well as it did. And people were just captivated with the story and Jordan Peele's kind of, I, th I believe this was his first outing as a director. And he certainly just created a story and a world and characters that just grabbed the audience and just didn't let go from the get go in this movie. And he's one of those guys, like we've kind of talked about a little bit earlier in the episode that I just can't wait to see what comes from the next that I'm just hanging on to everything that they do and seeing what they can create. So Get Out is just, I think it's a phenomenal original screenplay winner. Yeah, Get Out was good, man. I remember the first time I saw Get Out, I got to the end. I'll be honest, I didn't really get the end the first time I saw it. I had to, I, I, had to talk, I actually was texting with a buddy of mine, one that, a mutual friend of ours. And um, I had I had to be like, did you like? Can you tell me a little bit about the ending? Like, what what exactly does it mean? And he kind of laid it out for me, and I was like, oh. And then I actually went back and watched it not long after that, and I was like, I get it now. That is genius. I I, I fully I fully get it, and I fully appreciate what, what this movie did. And um, I like that like a lot of the story was based almost entirely on um, the one line Bradley Whitford says, which is, you know, I would have voted for Obama a, a, a third time if I could have, which is, uh, which is kind of what I think Jordan Peele had talked about in interviews about like what was almost the catalyst for, for writing the movie, which was, you know, this, this, this like people, white people almost don't really kind of get how essentially racist it is when they're trying not to be racist by just saying that that one line is like and it's it's interesting and i like i like hearing that too because it's it's so interesting when it comes to like the writing process you know he created he crafted this this great movie oscar-winning movie 
basically, you know, where does the inspiration come from? It came from essentially just one line. You know, he heard, he heard somebody say that and he crafted this entire horror movie. You know, that one line took him and his love of horror movies and crafted this, this, this movie that, that was interesting because it was released in February of that year. And it's very rare that a movie released so far before the next Oscars comes and, and wins Oscars. Yeah. I think that's a testament to him as a filmmaker that it kind of was nominated so quickly after it came out. And you're right. This is certainly a movie you have to go back and watch twice because there's a lot of kind of hidden things and meanings and symbolism that you obviously didn't pick up the first time that you watched it because you're watching these events unfold for the first time. So we've talked about Get Out a little bit before on the podcast on a previous episode, but you know we're not really kind of diving into spoilers because it's only a few years old, if you can believe it. But it is a movie that I will suggest if you haven't seen it, that you go back and watch twice because there's all these little masterful touches that you have no idea were there, that they meant something else, that again, it's just a great piece of film filmmaking by Jordan Peele. Yep. And this year you have two of the stars of that movie up for Oscars with one of them probably going to win, you know, like Keith Stanfield and Daniel Kaluuya are both nominated for supporting actor this year. And obviously they're both in get out. So it's a, it's, it's a good flick. So I know you probably like this category because you like the, the screenplay categories and you like the writing. So, you know, where did you have to pick a winner from with this? So we already talked about the movie, but, we're going to talk about the different aspect of the movie now, which is I picked Goodwill Hunting because it's another one of those like Rocky as a writer. It's just an inspirational story of these two actors, Ben Affleck, Matt Damon. They weren't happy with the roles they were getting. And so they said, well, let's just write our own movie. And so they wrote their own movie. Act it. They, they write it specifically for them to act in it. Uh, get Gus Van Sant, who's an indie, a big time indie director, to direct it. Um, actually, Kevin Smith, one of uh, one of my idols, was uh, very instrumental in getting that movie made because Ben Affleck and uh, and uh, uh, Kevin Smith worked together uh, in his movies. And Affleck gave Smith the script. Smith uh, was able to get it in the hands of uh, a certain executive who is currently in jail. Uh, you know Harvey Weinstein, and um, you know got the movie made. And I just it's it's such as it just became an inspirational story in terms just like rocky where they got it made their careers obviously they are matt damon and ben affleck two of the biggest stars ever and it started with good little hunting yeah i think it's just such uh not the norm when you have actors that at the time were still a little bit early on in their careers with matt damon and ben affleck that managed to write a great movie that managed to churn out a great script that that almost seems like that's not the norm where that kind of thing happens later in actors and actresses careers where if they dabble in writing that's when they get it right or when they start to write is a little bit later in the careers because they've been around and they've had a lot of ideas churning that have formed over the years. So really good for them that this kind of early on in their careers, they were able to write this script and B, get it made into a movie, which is a lot more difficult than people think, even if you're an actor in Hollywood, if you have an idea for a movie to actually get it made. But really good for them that they were able to do this this early in their career. Yeah, man. And, and it's a test. I like when scripts can come out and and the how you like them apples. You ever hear that? That is a direct quote, subconsciously or consciously, from Goodwill Hunting. All right. So on the flip side of this coin, we have best adapted screenplay. And the difference is original screenplay is something, an original idea that somebody wrote for a movie that then got made into the movie. And adapted screenplay is kind of taking something that is from some kind of source material, whether it's a TV show, book, whatever have you, real life story and turning it into a movie. So adapted screenplay. This movie that I picked, a past winner from 2003 specifically, this movie cleaned up at the Academy Awards. And that is the Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. This movie, a best adapted screenplay, was far from the only award that it won that year. Cleaned up at the Academy Awards. But I think pound for pound, this is probably one of the best adaptations that we've ever had. Translating this 
at the time, it was probably difficult, even though it doesn't really seem so in hindsight because they got the movie so right. But at the time, it was probably a very difficult adaptation to get right because there's so much happening and it might be hard to translate it into an exciting, captivating big screen movie that people will like, that will make money. But somehow they did it. And it's a and it's an amazing adaptation. Say what you will about it's 20 endings, but movie never seems to end. But the adapt the adaptation of it is just it's full of epic battles. It has character drama. It's just it takes everything from the book and just makes it a hundred times better. And I'm glad to say that when these movies were coming out, I was actually in elementary middle school at the time. And I'm glad to say that at that young age, I was able to read and process the three books before they became movies. You know, I had found out that the movies were coming out, that this was a classic fantasy series that I thought, you know what, let me go read this. And I actually really liked the books, even as a young kid. Right. On. Yeah, I never read those books. Um, when it comes to the movies, those are like Star Wars. Those are movies that I think a lot of people obsess over that I've seen. I enjoy. I appreciate. Not my favorite movies. But I do enjoy them. Just not my favorite. Um, but I will agree, winning a screenplay for you know, that was it's one of the few movies that, I don't believe it's the only movie, but I know it's one of the few that uh was a clean sweep. It won every uh Oscar it was nominated for that year. Even Steven Spielberg, when he ar- announced Best Picture that year, he said, and it's a clean sweep, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. And um I think that was a year, you know, uh, Peter Jackson also won for um director that year and that kind of goes harkens back to my james cameron thing which is the scope of these movies i i fully agree with the 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 academy awarding this movie as a it was it was it wasn't just for return of the king i don't think it was it was awarding all three movies just giving it to the finale because the scope of those movies to film three movies back to back to back like he did which hadn't really been done. I know Back to the Future two and three shot at the same time, but I don't. I'm not. I can't think of another trilogy of movies that all shot simultaneously. Like, yeah, like you said, say what you will about whether or not you're a massive Lord of the Rings fan or not, or if you liked the movie, just kind of watched it once and enjoyed it. That was it. There's no denying the scope of these movies and how massive and epic they are, and the scale and just all those things and. I do have a fan, a friend that's in that fan category that is a big Lord of the Rings fan that hopefully he's listening to this episode and, you know, here's the shout out. But yeah, there are certainly people who are massive fans of the franchise and become fans because of movies like this, because of movie series like the Harry Potter or the Lord of the Rings or these adaptations from book series that, again, people might have known about but not read, but then they go see the movie and they're captivated by it, and then they go back, and then they read the books. So, however, which order it ha- whichever order it happens in, good that a lot of people are really getting into these movies, and then the books, or vice versa. And it's just it gets people engrossed in different worlds and seeing different visions. Yeah, man. So I'll swing through with my pick now, which we may have talked. About. I think we did talk about it before, but I went with the Big Short, Adam McKay. Um, and the reason I picked that is because think about what the movie is about. The movie is about the stock market and the housing crash of, you know, 2008. And um, that could have been just the most boring movie you've ever seen with a bunch of people just explaining what happened. And in actuality, it's one of the most entertaining, funny uh, uh, movies about something that most people don't understand, but his screenplay makes you understand it like you watch that movie and you're like oh wow like that's what happened and and i i just i i love the movie i love the the way it's written the way he ex- he explains it you know he, he he'll have like a chunk of a, a scene that you're like what happened here and then he'll cut to you know somebody explaining exactly what happened in layman's terms and stuff and i just i really appreciated the writing of that Yeah, I think it's a testament to how good this adaptation was, is that you're able to take something that's a difficult concept to process it and turn it into something that's entertaining for mainstream audiences and get them to engage with the movie. So 
that certainly makes for a tricky adaptation and certainly makes for an award worthy movie if you're able to do that. So certainly deserving, of course, and Big Short, like we talked about it on a previous episode, I haven't seen it yet. It's on my long watch list of movies that I do one day want to see. So as soon as I do, I'll be sure to let you know offline what I think of it. But it certainly sounds like it was a difficult concept and a difficult movie to get mainstream audiences to come see to explain things like that and to put them into simple terms and to make a good watchable movie out of it for sure. Moving on to our next category, we're looking at best cinematography. And for the average person, they may not know what this means. This is how a movie is shot, the lighting, how it's depicted, how it's framed, all these things that go into the shot of a movie and how a scene is shot and put together and assembled on film. So it's probably a lot longer and and more technical than that. But just to put it in simple terms, essentially, that's what best cinematography is. So I really hope I'm holding out hope again that we picked us the same movie for a category here because the movie that I picked for a past winner is the 2016 movie La La Land best cinematography winner no No? not the same I'm lining these up for you where I'm picking some of your favorites where you talk about them all the time yeah I'm throwing you fastballs down the middle and saying hey I picked one of your favorites because I think it certainly deserved the award that it won that year And Best Cinematography, La La Land, talk about it all the time, big fan of musicals, and you didn't pick this one. Yeah, I mean, what can I say? It is, obviously, it's uh, one of my all-time favorite movies. The music in it, the cinematography is great. It's from Cinemascope. Uh, You know, it opens up big widescreen and everything. It it definitely was a deserving movie and everything. Uh, um, Yeah, we did not go the same route on this one. It's a shame because I'd love to kind of talk about La La Land with you where you picked it as well. And we were in sync where we both appreciated and we obviously do appreciate, but not in the way that we picked it to talk about the same movie. But the way that it's shot and, you know, it's it's very reminiscent of old Hollywood. And that's the vibe that they're kind of going for, where they're trying to evoke this sense of wonder and nostalgia and really you know, call back to the the glory days of Hollywood, the golden years and just the way it's shot and the way it's colored and the way it's lit. And it's just, it's, it's really just a masterful piece of, of cinematography. So, excuse me, certainly deserving of that win in 2016 for best cinematography. La La Land is just, it's shot very beautifully and it's just very well put together, if nothing else. Even if you don't like musicals, you could just put the, mu- the movie on mute and still just enjoy the beauty and the scale and the, the shot progression that it has. Oh, yeah. And it has one of my all-time favorite shots, which is uh, Someone in the Crowd, the song Someone in the Crowd. Where they go to like the big party and the camera jumps into the pool and then starts spinning around 360 of everybody dancing around the pool and jumping in. That's one of my all-time favorite shots. So you're right. I should have picked it. So what did you pick instead? I went with Blade Runner 2049, Roger Deakins, uh, one of the all-time great cinematographers. He was nominated 12 times previously. One, I think he's the most nominated cinematographer ever without a win. And then Blade Runner 2049 came out, and he finally won. I think, I think he's one of the few cinematographers, I believe, got a standing ovation when he won because he is a legend in the industry. And um, if you saw Blade Runner 2049, it is it's soaked in neon, the lights, the camera movements. It is it's a dark film, film noir, almost like like the original Blade Runner. It just it looks phenomenal. It is such a great looking movie. And and, you know, Roger Deakins is is like he's a legend. He's one of the best ever, which is kind of why I also like, you know, after not winning for so long. He won again two years later for 1917, which is, you know, a single a single uh, film to look like a single shot throughout the entire movie. And the guy is just a master. So for those who may not know, Roger Deakins is a masterful cinematographer. As you put it, he was nominated a ton of times and finally was able to get a couple of Oscar wins. But he is essentially the the guy. If you want the best cinematographer in the business He's the person that you hire. And people at home may not know, he may not be a a household name for casual moviegoers, but 
he has worked on a lot of these classic movies that you've seen that, you know, if you are able to kind of notice that where, hey, I really like how this is shot or how this scene is lit, it's probably been Roger Deakins behind that magic. So certainly deserving. He is the person in cinematography and movies over the last however many years he's been working. So very deserving. Very glad he finally got a win. Yeah, yeah. So do you kind of forgive me now for who I picked and everything? It's just I wanted to talk about Roger Deakins. Yes, Roger Deakins is certainly very, very talented and very deserving. But I, I'm still a little disappointed you didn't pick La La Land because you like to talk about it so much on the show. But I certainly understand the direction that you went. So next up, we have Best Production Design. And this is exactly what it sounds like. It's the best design of a set or the best kind of props that you see dotted around a scene or basically the, when they build the scene, when they build the background, they build the setting that the movie is taking place in. That's what they mean by production design, essentially the setting of the movie. So this is something, again, maybe not a lot of people really pay attention to, but nonetheless, it engrosses people when you have great production design. And for my money, the, my favorite winner from this category from the past is one that we've already mentioned on this episode, which is the 1997 movie Titanic. And again, because we've already touched on it a little bit before, James Cameron just masterfully put everything together and his attention to detail is astounding in recreating the ship and the interior and all these little details from about 100 years ago from the time this movie was made, almost 100 years ago, but just masterfully crafted and just set design is just amazing in this movie 100 percent agree with that absolutely love titanic so i mean the way they recreated the titanic on the blu-ray they have uh several documentaries about the production of the movie and i've watched them all um and they're phenomenal they they recreated almost an entire replica of the titanic down in mexico it's uh it's it's this the scope i mean that's like the word of the day if we were to be Pee Wee herman show scope would be our you know word of the day and uh i'll be honest man i'm a little disappointed this one we didn't get the same i thought we would have the same pick on this one so you know we've talked about titanic and a little bit about the look and feel of it already so you know maybe we can just move on to your pick but i will say closing about the best production design for titanic when it won in 1997 go back and watch the movie and you will see the attention to detail and all these little touches that just make the movie complete and make it really feel like it's taking place on a Titanic in the early 19th century. Oh yeah. Without a doubt, one of the greatest set designs ever and deserved win. But I'll say my pick, and this was one, this was the one I thought we were going to go the same route with. And I went with the 1989 Batman movie because Come on, man. That movie has the Batcave, the darkness of it. It's just this, the production design, the set design, just everything about that movie is so it's so perfect perfect and meticulous. And it, it's, it's a big comic book movie, but yet it still has that kind of intimate Tim Burton feel to it. And, and the feel of a Tim Burton movie is steeped in production design. Think of every Tim Burton movie you've ever seen. Beetlejuice, Edward Sis, all of them. The production design of a Burton movie is so important to that feel. And Batman, for my money, is 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 one of the best. That's fair. I know I've said before, I'm not the biggest Tim Burton fan, and I certainly did look hard at 1989's Batman for best production design when it won. And I certainly agree with you where the dark, gothic, dingy kind of look that Tim Burton crafted for this movie certainly deserves recognition. I just, again, I'm not the biggest Tim Burton fan, so I certainly recognize his talent. I certainly agree that Batman was very deserving of winning. But again, just Titanic, I just thought, and again, I was of the same mind where I thought you would pick the same movie. Again, it was just compared to that, just how masterfully crafted it was and all the little minute details that went into it, yes, the look and feel of Batman is, is very great and very unique, especially at that time. But Titanic just won out for me, but I certainly did take a, a good long look at Batman and thought about picking that one for best production design for my favorite past winner from this category. Oh, we got a few more categories to go. I have faith we're going to match on one of them. So let's let's move on. 
Next up, we have best visual effects winners from past years. And this one was very tough for me because this is one that is very near and dear to my heart because I majored in digital animation in college. And this was initially maybe something that I wanted to go into was visual effects in major motion pictures. And it's something I still really appreciate to this day. And I will say this is my second kind of honorable mention that I've had for a category where it was so razor thin for me deciding on just one to talk about. So my honorable mentions, just really quick, are two movies, and they're both directed by the same director, James Cameron, and that is Terminator 2 and Avatar. Both just astounding, groundbreaking visual effects movies, among other things. Of course, it wasn't just visual effects that carried these movies, maybe Avatar a little bit, but certainly at the time, the visual effects that were made for both of these movies were groundbreaking. James Cameron literally had to invent new technology to bring to life his visions for these movies and get the visual effects right. And both of these still stand up to this day, but that is not the one that I picked. The one that I picked was the 1977 winner for best visual effects and that is the original Star Wars movie. I mean, what more is there to say? Just crafting a vision and doing things on screen with lightsabers and blaster effects and to scale spaceships floating in space and planets exploding. What else can you say about this, especially at the time? I wish I could almost go back and see this movie when it premiered in theaters and see people's reactions. It just visually just groundbreaking and still just a delight to watch to this day. Yeah. And I think Terminator two and star Wars are great examples of, uh, movies, uh, you know, 77 and, and 91. And yet the visuals, if you were to watch them today, you would be like, those were made today. The, the, the technology, it looks like it was just made. I, I mean, they, they hold, as you said, they hold up and, and there are movies I've watched recently that came out not long ago where the visuals are absolute garbage. So when you compare them to like a, a star Wars, a Terminator two, it's, it's astounding that they actually were able to, to, to create what they did with those movies. And, and yeah, what can you say about star Wars, dude? It's, it's probably the most influential movie ever made. Absolutely. So tons of great picks for best visual effects. So this one, I wasn't really holding out hope that we picked the same one, even though I thought Star Wars might be a pretty big choice to pick. But what did you go with for your favorite past winner for best visual effects? I was holding out hope we'd pick the same movie because I went with The Matrix. Come on, man. That movie, in terms of visual effects, that movie is probably... It's in the same vein as a Star Wars. It's in terms of it's one of the most influential movies I think ever made, and it was the first time bullet time, man. And you, the bullet time shots. I don't know if you ever watched the behind the scenes features for that. The way they shot it was they just they took a, a semicircle of I think seventy or eighty cameras and they lined them up in a circle like that, and then and, and then they just shot it one frame at a time like that, and that's how they did bullet time and everything, and 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 it's just. For my money, that is one of the best visual effects movie ever made. Certainly another groundbreaking visual effects movie. And I will give you credit for that. It is a good pick. It just it did kind of change the game when it came out and did have visuals in it that were unprecedented in movies before it. And I know you're a big Matrix fan, so I didn't really pick against that knowing that you would pick that one. But the Matrix certainly, you know how you've made it when other movies and TV shows and all these other adaptations spoof your movie to death. You know, the bullet time sequence has been spoofed to death and imitated to death. And really, that's how you know that you have something special and something unique is when everyone else copies you and does a nod to that, where they reference that bullet time scene. And that's certainly one, but obviously... A lot of other aspects to the movie are groundbreaking visual effects as well, especially for that time. But, you know, that is obviously the scene that a lot of people think of when they think The Matrix is that specific visual effects when talking about this category. Yeah, nothing more to say about it. One of the greatest ever. So next up is another one that's also very near and dear to my heart, and that's Best Animated Feature, because I think animation is, again, another kind of genre of movies that really doesn't get enough recognition from the Academy and from moviegoers as a whole. So 
best animated feature. I don't think we will have the same one on this. I'd be surprised if we did, but I went with a recent winner, and that is the 2018 winner for best animated feature at the Academy Awards, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And the reason I picked this one, we've talked about this movie a little bit before on the podcast on a previous episode, but just let's start off visually. It's just so different from everything else these days. I think we've gotten so used to that Disney Pixar look and feel to animated movies that whenever something like this comes out, no matter what the movie's about or what it features or anything like that, just visually, it already has people's attention because it looks so different because we've just gotten so used to that same look for animation that Disney Pixar just churns out movies that are of good quality most of the time. But again, just they all look the same. So visually, this one is phenomenal. And let's not forget, it has an amazing story, very touching, emotional tones to it and very great, funny characters. And just, you know, when you're talking about a best animated feature film winner, obviously, it has to be good from top to bottom. And I certainly think that is this movie. Yeah, I really I really like that Spider-Man movie. I'm looking forward to the sequel. Um, <clears throat> I also like that that was the year. So Phil Lord, Chris Miller are the producers of that movie. And they won the Oscar that year. But they had been in the news earlier that year because they were actually fired from directing Solo. So I actually really appreciated that they get fired for directing Solo. And then a couple months later, they're up at the Academy Awards accepting their Oscar. I thought that was kind of a good, you know, stick it to, you know, Lucasfilm or not really Lucasfilm because he doesn't really produce it, but Kathleen Kennedy, really. And I really, I, I actually was, even, even though I love the movie, the, the story of them winning after the very public uh, firing from Solo, like made me like really happy that they won that Oscar. Absolutely. A turn of events that worked out for the far better, of course. So I have no idea where you went for this category for past winner for best animated feature film. What did you pick out for your favorite from the past to talk about? So this is actually a relatively new category. It was only introduced in uh, 2001, so 20 years. And so I just went with the very first winner of the category, Shrek. Shrek was the first ever winner of best animated feature. And uh, it still holds up today, man. It is a, that is a PG rated kids movie with some of the most adult humor you've kind of seen in a movie in a while. It's, 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 it's got some great gross out humor that probably kids when they saw it didn't understand, but parents are like, Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Shrek. Uh, I did forget to mention up top that this is a new category. And again, going back to what I said about the Academy, not really recognizing animation for what it should be has only been around for around 20 years. And Shrek was the very first winner and I think deservedly so. It certainly, again, is, is different looking. It has different characters and different story to it. And visually, is still pretty good for when it was made. It may not, if you go back and watch it, look as sharp as some of the movies these days. Because, again, the technology just wasn't quite there yet for making it look super impressive. But not that it looks terrible either. So Shrek, definitely an odd kind of winner when you look back at the winners for animated feature film oscar winning movies and it's funny to have shrek in that conversation but when you think about it it kind of makes sense yeah yeah great flick great animated flick holds up i i still enjoy watching uh all four of them actually to this day so so our last category that we're going to wrap up this episode here with is best original score and this is, again, something that maybe not that many people pay attention to during the movie, but it's that that music, that orchestral music or other types of music that underscore a scene where characters are talking, but it's still something that you really notice and really take stock of if it's really good. And I certainly hope that my choices that I kind of talk about here are really good ones that people say, yes, that makes total sense. And again, this is an honorable mention for me because it was just so close and so many talented people and my honorable mentions that i went with same composer two different movies two years apart and that's john williams for jaws in 1976 and star wars in 1978 
and both what can you say about their soundtracks as soon as i just said those movie titles you're thinking instantly of the score that they're famous for jaws is the like everyone knows that and then obviously star wars as well with its theme but again the one that i picked as my favorite past winner to talk about is my probably my favorite movie composer which is hans zimmer for 1994's lion king and I could honestly just listen to the score on CD, MP3, whatever you want to say, streaming. I could probably just listen to the Lion King score over and over again just by itself without any dialogue or not watching the movie itself. So epic, so emotional. Hans Zimmer, in my eyes, is probably the best film composer that we have these days. And there are some great ones out there. Don't get me wrong. I like other composers these days as well in movies that I really like their work. but. The Lion King to me just really speaks to me and just my favorite winner for best original score in past years. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, touch on Jaws. Jaws was an interesting because I think when Steven Spielberg first heard it, he, did, he didn't like it. When he first heard that, uh, as you so succinctly put it, duh, duh, duh. Um, <laughs> but when he first heard it, he, he, he didn't like it. And then it was just... As, as the film rolled out, I think they did test screenings and he saw the audience's reaction and everything. And, and he was like, oh, that's genius. And, and just think, two notes. Two notes became the most iconic score, one of the most iconic scores ever created. Um, but to get to your pick, a Lion King, yeah, Lion King is, is a phenomenal score. It's a phenomenal soundtrack. You know, Elton John and everything, uh, pulling in the soundtrack for that one. And, 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 uh, and it's good. I mean, it's, it's, I like the inspiration uh, that he talks about the inspiration for that a lot with a lot of the African uh, uh, music and, and stuff they took inspiration from for that movie. And, and it, it, it is, it's a great, great score that accompanies a kid's retelling of Hamlet really, which is insane to even think about that. It's a kid's kid's Hamlet. So can I take a guess on what I think you picked as your favorite kind of past winner to talk about? Uh, yeah, you can. I didn't pick a winner. I went with a nominee, though. So, Was it the same composer? Was it Hans Zimmer for Interstellar? That is it. <laughs> um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull a Mitch here because I this is the only one where I had runner-ups because I did want a runner-up with Clint Mansell's score for Requiem for a Dream. Uh, if you don't, that may not be a movie or something that you immediately know what the score is. But I guarantee you've heard the score because it has been used in almost it's been used in so many trailers over the years. It's, it's an iconic score and it's it's phenomenal. And and uh, last year's winner, Joker, one of the best scores ever created, man. I mean, the whole bathroom dance scene, it's one of the best scenes ever. That is one of the best scenes ever because of the score. But to get to Interstellar, that is my all time favorite score. It is it is church organs playing masterfully it's 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 so great and and so when it comes to Hans Zimmer you and me agree he is my all-time favorite composer I've actually seen him in concert I went and saw him in concert one of the best concerts I've ever seen dude it was just great and you have it was probably like 80 people on the stage man you 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 wonder how these scores are created man watch it and there's a dvd out it's called live in Prague. if you get the chance check it out it's 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 essentially it is the concert i went and saw but um just hearing like a lot of these these film scores you you, you you're like how did they do that and you're like oh that's what what is that they use like a didgeridoo and you're like oh wow that's how that that's weird that's awesome that that that's how that score was made and for me, film scores are I, they're one of the most important pieces of a movie. It, they convey emotion better than any other aspect, I think. Yeah, so you touched on a couple different things. So kind of let me just move through that really quick. I will say, yes, it's always fascinating if you go and watch how they make scores or sounds for movies if you go back and watch, because it's not something you really think about that much, but if you go back and watch a little video or documentary about how they put together film scores or how they make certain sounds for movies, it's really fascinating how they have these ideas and how they make them a reality with the instruments or tools that they use. But you're right, Hans Zimmer, one of my favorite composers these days, I knew you couldn't resist picking a movie that he scored, even if it wasn't a past winner. 
and Interstellar is certainly deserving. So I know you had said you've bought that soundtrack before. And the score that he did for this, obviously, it's very sci-fi sounding, yet it's very emotional and it's very epic. And that has to fit into the movie, which it certainly does, because those are the themes and those are the ideas that drives home about Interstellar is that it's all those things that the score reinforces. But yeah, it's it's always crazy to see, especially in concert, because, again, you don't really think about it that much how many people it takes to put together a score like this too, that it's not just one person in a room playing a couple instruments or pressing a couple buttons or just mixing some sound together. It, the good ones have just a wide range of different people, a massive group of people putting together these scores. And it's just great to see people recognizing when they do all the people that put in hard work to make that a reality. Without a doubt, dude. And I will recommend it. It's a Blu-ray, DVD, whatever. It's called Hans Zimmer Live in Prague. And he does Lion King in it. He does you know every major score you can think of of Hans Zimmer. It's Gladiator, Inception, all, all the major ones, dude. He does them live. And it's, 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 check it out, dude. It's phenomenal. Thank you to everybody for tuning in for another episode of Life Imitating Movies weekly podcast where myself and Brad talk about news stories from across the internet from the past week and the movies that we think have already been made that resemble them. And we didn't really do that this week per se, but we still had fun talking about past Oscar winners and some of our favorites. But we'll be back to that usual format next week where we'll be covering different news stories from the past week from across the internet and the movies that we think kind of resemble those as well. So we will be ending next week's episode kind of back to a new release movie, which is Mortal Kombat. So I'm very excited about that because I haven't quite seen the movie yet, but I certainly will. And I certainly hope it's enjoyable. Yeah, man. I'm, uh, it's been a nice two week reprieve from our usual format. I can talk about the award season endlessly. Um, obviously, um, so I, I've enjoyed these two weeks we did. But yeah, getting back, we'll touch on some topics, pick some movies, and Mortal Kombat. I, I'm really looking forward to Mortal Kombat. I love the original, so I'm looking forward to checking that one out. So thank you to everybody for tuning in, and we'll be back at our usual time Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern, with a new episode of Life Imitating Movies. Thank you for tuning in.